Before I begin, be sure to like the video and leave a comment on what you think of it. Also, be sure to subscribe to my channel and ring the bell to keep up with further audiobook readings. Chapter 14 Boom! Me and Jada were knocked out. The previous two weeks had been the biggest grind of my professional career. 16 hour days, no weekends off, for 15 straight days. I was exhausted. It was 3 a.m. when the phone rang. Those middle of the night calls always suck. Somebody's either in jail, the hospital, or worse. Yo, I said in a groggy, raspy, hopeful whisper. Man, you see them numbers? The voice bellowed as if it were noon on a football field. Huh? Hey, Dad, what? I said, did you see these goddamn numbers? Daddy-o reiterated. Independence Day had just opened. It was 6 a.m. in Philly, and the film had broken every conceivable box office record. It was world news. Dad, it's only 3 a.m. out here. I said, did you see these goddamn numbers? He seemed pretty hell-bent on getting his questions answered. Nah, Dad, I haven't seen him yet. JL will- Remember, I told you! There's no such thing as luck. That you are the creator of your own destiny. Remember I told you that? Yeah, Dad, I remember. But can we- Remember I told you that there was no such thing as luck. Only what you make. Remember I told you that? Of course, Dad. You would say that all the time, but remember I told you there's no such thing as luck. Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Remember I told you that? Yes, Dad. Absolutely. Well, that's a bunch of bull. You're the luckiest mother I ever met in my life. This was one of the greatest laughs daddy and I ever shared. Waves of raucous laughter settling back to giggles and then, with no words and no warning, erupting again into hysteria. Years of discord, not justified, but somehow cleansed with every purifying wave, we probably laugh without speaking for ten minutes. Though we never talked about it, Independence Day represented a significant victory for him. A validation. It put an exclamation point on some story he had been telling himself about himself. Something was finished in his mind. Not long after, he sold ACRAC. The work of the Ice House was done. He started calling himself the Fresh King. The next ten years of my professional life were an absolute unadulterated, unblemished route of the entertainment industry. Bad Boys, Independence Day, Men in Black, Enemy of the State, Wild Wild West, Ali, Men in Black 2, Bad Boys 2, I, Robot, Shark Tale, Hitch, The Pursuit of Happiness, I Am Legend, and Hancock, resulting in more than eight billion dollars in global box office. And not to be a stickler, but that number is from almost 30 years ago, when tickets were less than half of the price they are today. Adjusting for inflation, you know what, that's neither here nor there. Two Academy Award nominations, Ali and The Pursuit of Happiness. Over 30 million records sold, Men in Black, getting jiggy with it, just the two of us, Miami, and Wild Wild West leading the charge. Not to mention the theme song from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, which technically counts as a record. In which case, it's the biggest rap song in history, but that's neither here nor there either. I'm getting ahead of myself. Independence Day had just come out, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air was in Season 6, 
JL had gotten us a seat at the big table. We were now represented by Ken Stovitz and Richard Lovett at the most powerful agency in Hollywood, CAA, and I had just gotten back to even with the IRS. Now I was just broke. From this point on, I could start making some money. Bad Boys had hit movie theaters in 1995 and had been a solid success. Nothing earth-shattering, but a whole lot of earth-shaking was going on. I had grown up as the lanky, goofy kid with the big ears, but I snuck into a movie theater on opening weekend of Bad Boys, and the scene came where I ran across the bridge with my shirt open. I heard a forty-something black woman purr out, Mmm, look at Will. I wanted to scream, I'm right here, miss. It was the first time I had ever experienced a woman having a sexual reaction to my manness. Up until this point in my life, I had used comedy to attract women, and now I was being objectified. It was wonderful. All I could think was, okay, Michael Bay, you were right, I was wrong, thank you. From that point forward, directors had to argue with me to keep my shirt on. We were preparing to go into our sixth season of The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, and I had just signed on to shoot Independence Day over the summer of 1995. The sixth season was our final contracted season. The question arose, would I do a seventh? The ratings of The Fresh Prince had fallen slightly, but progressively. The storylines were becoming increasingly hokey, and it was difficult to maintain the freshness but we were all making more money than we'd ever made in any previous season. There is an episode of Happy Days in which Fonzie literally jumped over a shark on water skis dressed in his signature leather jacket. In the world of sitcom TV, jumping the shark is now used metaphorically to signal the beginning of the end, the moment after which a television show has passed its prime. Whatever made the show special is now increasingly hard to capture. The problem is, you don't know it at the time. You always feel that you can rekindle the magic. Anyone who has ever been on a sitcom can tell you the episode in which their show jumped the shark. Ours was season 5, episode 15, Bullets Over Bel Air, the one in which I got shot and Carlton started carrying a gun. I had successfully fulfilled a promise to myself that I would never get caught in a cycle of deterioration without having the next thing on tap. The show could easily sustain another season. This was my family. I loved them. But a movie career was now a viable option. I was at a crossroads. John Amos, the legendary actor who played James Evan, on the iconic 1970s hit sitcom Good Times, co-starred in three episodes of The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. His character on Good Times was famously and brutally killed off because of a contract dispute. The show was ultimately cancelled mid-season. No final episode, no goodbyes, no beautiful montage of memorable moments. Just over. John Amos had heard the rumblings of my consideration of a seventh season. One day, between rehearsals, he took me for a walk in the parking lot. This is one of the most beautiful sets I've ever worked on, John said. I can feel that you all really love each other. Yes, sir, I said. We've all fallen into our character roles in real life. I may be overstepping my bounds a bit here, John went on. But none of these executives, or producers, or business people give a <coughs> about your family. Do not let them <coughs> off all of your hard work and passion. It is your responsibility to make sure these people get to leave this show with some dignity. I had remembered, even as a child, being jarred by James Evans' death on good times. As a kid, I wouldn't have used the word dignity. But in retrospect, there was a sense of disrespect that my heart sensed. 
As a fan, I felt insulted and abused by the narrative. John's character was unceremoniously killed off, and almost 20 years later, the man himself spoke the word that fit the hole in my heart. The hole was undignified. I even sensed John's pain, that maybe he had failed his TV family. The next week, I gathered my cast together. I told everyone that season 6 would be our final season and that they should take the year to make whatever plans or preparations they felt necessary. I promised them that we would go out with style and grace. The final episode of The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air aired on May 20th, 1996, a one-hour finale. The week of shooting had been the most emotional week of my professional life. We laughed, we cried, we reminisced, we loved on each other, and we said goodbye. I sent my television family off with dignity. Meanwhile, in my real-life family, I had to pay my own child support. Not to my ex-wife for my child. That would be normal and right. I had to pay my child support to my own mother for myself. Plus interest and penalties. Exactly. Let me explain. Harry had graduated from Hampton University with an accounting degree and had been in charge of all family investments. He was now taking the family into real estate, and his first official venture was to help Mom Mom secure the home of her dreams. They found an old farmhouse in Brim Mar, Pennsylvania. Mom Mom was head over heels, so on Christmas morning 1997, we surprised her with the keys. In the move from Woodcrest, sifting through ancient boxes, Mom Mom had found her and Dad's unexecuted divorce papers. Almost 20 years earlier, they had gone through the whole divorce process, but for whatever reason, they never got around to signing the final documents. Mom Mom didn't realize that, technically, she wasn't actually divorced. So she signed her divorce papers and filed them. I'm on set shooting Wild Wild West when I get an urgent call from Daddy-O demanding a mandatory and immediate family meeting minus Mom Mom. Still dressed in chaps and spurs, I joined Harry and Ellen on the call. Did any of y'all talk to your mother? Daddy-O says. Uh, we talk to her all the time. Is there something specific? I said. She sent over these divorce papers, Daddy-O said and I want to know what y'all think I should do with them. Just for a little context, our parents had been separated for 20 years, and they have barely exchanged three words in the last decade, and two of the words are unprintable. daddy had even started a new family. I had a beautiful new sister named Ashley. So, as his loving children, we find ourselves legitimately confused. And as his loving children, we have roles we tend to play. Ellen never has time for his foolishness. Harry wants to go head to head and challenge every syllable he utters, and I try to be the peacemaker. Therefore, as a rule, I tend to talk first. Well, what exactly do you mean, Dad? I say gently and lovingly, recognizing there's something going on that I don't understand. This causes my father to repeat slightly louder and more aggressively, as if tone and tenor were the basis of my misunderstanding. Your mother sent over these divorce papers, and I said I want to know what y'all think I should do with them. Immediately, there is a break in the sibling ranks. Ellen says, I don't have time for this. I'll talk to y'all later. We're losing numbers rapidly. We're suffering casualties. I need to resolve this quickly. Well, Dad, we heard you. It's just that you and Mommy have barely spoken in 20 years. So I just... I'm asking y'all what you think I should do with these divorce papers. Now Harry's heard enough and blurts out indignantly. Sign them? Oh, just sign them? Just like that? 
Frankly, Daddy O's starting to lose me. Dad, I don't understand the question. You and Mommy's relationship. Oh, so you think I should just sign him too? Daddy O said. Well, yes, I said. And throw it all away? Just like that? To this day, I have no idea what Daddy O was thinking. Maybe there was some bizarre finality in the signature that was too much to bear. Maybe it was why he never signed them in the first place, but the first domino had been tipped. Mom Mom's filing of the divorce papers triggered the full weight of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Daddy O had taken care of us, but he had never officially paid child support, a fact that came to light upon the basic review of the paperwork. Mom Mom was informed that with interest and penalties, Daddy O owed her close to $140,000, and she wanted every single dime of her money. Under Pennsylvania law, if he refused or couldn't afford to pay, he could be arrested, jailed, and have his assets seized by the sheriff. Mom, I pleaded, don't be like that. No, he owes me money, and I want it. Mom, he doesn't have $140,000. Well, that sounds like a personal problem to me, she said. Come on, Mom, you're in your new house. Everything's good. Let's just make this go easy. Oh, this'll go real easy. He's gonna give me my money, or he's going to jail. Mom, Mom wouldn't budge. Too many years of daddy -o's crap. And don't you help him out with nothing, Will, she said pointing at me like silly from the color purple. Let him figure out how he's gonna pay me my money. I was stuck. daddy -o didn't have $140,000, and Mom-Mom was unwilling to make any concession whatsoever. And there was no version of me letting my father go to jail. So, in an underhanded, Ponzi-style backdoor deal, I transferred $140,000 into Daddy O's account. He immediately cut a check to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for the full amount, and the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania made Mom Mom whole on back child support. This made me the first person in the history of Pennsylvania to pay their own dang child support. Note, when Mom Mom found out that I had paid Daddy O's debt, she was pissed and immediately wrote me a check for $140,000, making her the first person in the history of Pennsylvania to pay her own child back the child support that they had paid for themselves. We should tell this story again during Black History Month. Planet Hollywood was launching in Sydney, Australia in May 1996. It was a theme restaurant that celebrated the history of Tinseltown. Three of the founding members of the project were three of the biggest movie stars in the world, the Three Wise Men, the Hollywood Magi, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Sylvester Stallone, and Bruce Willis. I was invited to attend the grand opening. I cancelled everything and cleared my schedule for the opportunity to be in the same room with the three masters who could absolutely show me the road. The opening of the restaurant was as big as any movie premiere. Red carpets, searchlights, a massive press line, fans screaming and jockeying for autographs. I made my way into a green room set up in the rear of the restaurant, and there they were, all three of them together, Arnold, Sly, Bruce. I channeled my inner Charlie Mack and interrupted their conversation. Hey guys! Congrats on everything with the restaurant. They politely acknowledged my youthful enthusiasm with a subtle hint of, uh, you don't interrupt the three biggest movie stars in the world when you've only done one film and a TV show. Undeterred, I kept going. Quick question, I want to do what y'all are doing. I want to be the biggest movie star in the world. And if there was ever an iconic trio, who knew? I know it's y'all. They all chuckled. I guess the audacity of the question qualified me for an honest answer. They all looked at one another, 
and in some secret, non-verbal, biggest movie star in the world language, they decided that it would be Arnold who answered me. Imagine the following in the Arnold voice. You are not a movie star if your movies are only successful in America. You are not a movie star until every person in every country on earth knows who you are. You have to travel the globe, shake every hand, kiss every baby. Think of yourself as a politician running for biggest movie star in the world. Bruce and Sly concurred. Thank you guys, I said. I didn't mean to interrupt. Y'all can go ahead back to talking. I walked away like the kid in the Mean Joe Green Coke commercial from the 80s. Mean Joe was a famous football player, and he throws the kid his jersey after the Super Bowl. Arnold had given me the key. The key that would become my secret weapon for the next two decades. This made perfect sense to me. The movie companies were putting up north of $150 million to plaster the movie posters in every country in the world. I would get to piggyback on their massive financial investment. In my mind, I was never promoting a movie. I was using their $150 million to promote me. As far as I was concerned, the movie's not the product here. I am the product. I was grateful to the movie companies for their investment in my future. I started to notice how much other actors hated traveling, press, and promoting. It seemed like utter insanity to me. JL and I ran the numbers. We realized, for example, a film that might only earn 10 million in Spain could easily earn 15 to 25 million if you go to the country, do a premiere, a day of press, and a couple of fan events. It doesn't hurt if you learn a handful of phrases in the local language and say them on the news. If you multiply that across 30 global territories, actually showing up in the countries could take a $250 million box office global potential north of half a billion dollars. As a gross participant, a portion of those extra dollars went directly into my pocket. Not to mention, I became a bigger movie star in each specific territory, meaning that the next movie company would pay me more money than any other actor, because they knew I could double or maybe even triple the bottom line through global promotions. So, I would shoot the fresh Prince of Bel-Air during the week, leave the set, go straight to the airport, fly to Europe overnight, land Saturday morning, do interviews all day, do a premiere, sign autographs all night, head straight back to the airport, hop back on the jet, memorize my lines for the next Fresh Prince episode on the flight, and land in LA just in time to go to sleep Sunday night. Then I'd wake up Monday morning and do it all over again. I had been given the holy grail of movie stardom. I scanned the field of my competition to see who else knew, who else held the secret, and Tom Cruise was the head of the pack. I started quietly monitoring all of Tom's global promotional activities. When I arrived in a country to promote my movie, I would ask the local movie executives to give me Tom's promotional schedule, and I vowed to do two hours more than whatever he did in every country. Unfortunately, Tom Cruise is either a cyborg, or there are six of him. I was receiving reports of four and a half hour stretches on red carpets in Paris, London, Tokyo. In Berlin, Tom literally signed every single autograph until there was no one else who wanted one. Tom Cruise's global promotions were the individual best in Hollywood. How could I beat him? What do I have that he doesn't have? Then it hit me. Music. I started setting up stages and doing live performances, free music concerts outside the movie premiere for the fans who couldn't get in to see the film. We once had 10,000 people fill the streets in Piccadilly Circus, London. 
it was so wild that the police had to ultimately shut it down. Same in Berlin. Red Square in Moscow was the biggest ever Hollywood premiere up until that point. Tom couldn't do that. Neither could Arnold, Bruce, or Sly. I'd found my way out of the entertainment news segment and into headline news. And once your movie moves from entertainment to news, it's no longer a movie. It's a cultural phenomenon. The special effects in Independence Day were beyond anything anyone had seen up until that time. The promotions for the film simply showed an alien ship hovering over the White House and blowing it up in a single laser strike. People lost their dang minds. Independence Day earned $306 million in the United States. The movie company was happy and had broken even. But then the global promotions kicked in. 72 million in Germany, 58 million in the UK, 40 million in France, 23 million in Italy, and 93 million in Japan alone. Within a month, it was the second highest grossing film of all time, topping out at $817 million, an unheard of number at the time, and all on a $75 million budget. We had found the formula. Independence Day had special effects, creatures, and a love story. And when we added our global promotional sledgehammer, two words. Scorched Earth. I had gone from being poor to rich to broke with no acting experience to starring in the highest grossing film in the world and I was only 27 years old. I felt invincible, but I had felt that before. I knew what it was like to have the wind at my back, but this time my foot was on the gas and I wasn't letting up until the wheels fell off. Full beast mode. It is very difficult to tell this next story without either cloaking its graphic nature in euphemism and innuendo, and thereby diluting its potency, or being so explicit as to offend the delicate reader and <coughs> up my book sales. But this is such a pivotal and astonishing experience in my life and my relationship with Jada that I feel impelled to roll my literary dice. We were in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. It was one of our favorite hideaways. We had rented a beautiful hacienda in the hills. Jada and I had spent a raucous evening in the company of our dear friend Jose Cuervo. That's a euphemism. Jada was on top of me as the sweet crescendo simultaneously crept upon us. Innuendo. I'm crescendoing, she said. I'm crescendoing. I'm crescendoing too, I said. And as the majestic movement reached its culmination, a shockwave shudders through Jada's body. And then, panic. A look of abject terror washed over her face. I'm pregnant, she said. What? At first, I thought she was joking, so I began to snicker. Oh no, oh no, oh no, this can't happen, this can't happen, she said, rocking back and forth with two fistfuls of her own hair. Now I'm cracking up. It's not funny, Will. It felt like a lock on a vault, one of those big wheels that spins and bolts into place. I felt it, I'm telling you, I'm pregnant. Babe, I'm no fertility expert, I said, choking back laughter but I'm pretty sure they're not even finished swimming yet. I think scientifically, you can't be pregnant. I know my body will, she snapped. I'm pregnant. Then she rolled over and burst into tears. I couldn't figure out what the hell was happening, but she was serious and genuinely scared. I wanted to be helpful, so I rubbed her back and said, babe, just stand up and jump up and down. Will! Stop it! What are we gonna do? I felt like this was now going too far and she needed tough love. Jada, stop trippin'! 
I said sternly. I understand that you're experiencing something right now, but you are not pregnant. It doesn't happen that fast. It's impossible. Jaden Christopher Sire Smith was born on July 8, 1998, pretty much nine months to the day. In our family, we affectionately refer to his conception as the miracle, but the road to his birth was a rocky one. Jada didn't believe in conventional marriage and despised the traditional ceremony. She also had questions about the viability of monogamy as a framework for successful long-term relationships. Jada had dreamed about a simple, alternative ceremony. She saw herself on a mountaintop in a white dress, just she and I, no preacher, no family, no witnesses just us and God. She had studied the evolution of marriage law from slavery through reconstruction, and this had given her a serious aversion to the idea that she had to ask the government for permission to pledge her life to her beloved. Jada wanted to look into my eyes, devote her undying love before God, and then get on with the difficult business of building a life together. Jada had no illusion that love and family would be an easy endeavor. This was another reason she hated traditional wedding ceremonies. She thought that the fluffiness and the pageantry of a classic wedding ceremony was flawed symbolism and gave a false sense of the true gravity of the undertaking. She would say, A real wedding ceremony should be a marathon. We should have to run an actual marathon together. And if we're both still there at the finish line, then we've earned the right to get married. You gotta know that that person is a survivor. While I understood her point, I would always think to myself, that's some real unromantic <laughs> right there. Would we have them shiny tinfoil blankets awkwardly slung over my shoulders to prevent hypothermia and crap running down the back of our legs? I did not say this out loud. I got an emergency call from Jada's mother, Gammy. She was near tears. Will, you and Jada have to get married, Gammy pleaded. I hear all this newfangled foolishness y'all are talking about, but you have to have a wedding. Like regular people, like normal people, with an aisle, a pastor, and some cake. Gam. I'm with you, I said. I already gave her a ring. And you think I want to tell Gigi I'm having a baby and I'm not getting married? Will, this is my only child, Gammy said. Please, please, please convince her to have a wedding. I want to see y'all get married. The family wants to be there to support you. I hear you, Gam. Have you told Jada how you feel? Yes, I have, Gam said but she is not trying to hear it. All right, I got you, Gam. We'll figure it out. Jada held her ground as long as she could, but pretty soon, the wedding pressure became too much. She was in her second trimester. She was tired and uncomfortable and didn't want to argue. She also couldn't bear the thought of breaking her mother's heart, and deep down inside, even though I wasn't saying it, she knew I wanted a wedding too. So she agreed to have a traditional ceremony in Baltimore on New Year's Eve under one condition. Gammy had to handle everything. Jada agreed to show up, walk down the aisle, eat some cake, yell Happy New Year, and be out. Gam was ecstatic. To this day, Jada refers to our ceremony as Gammy's wedding. It was beautiful. It took place in a historic castle just outside the city. It was a very small ceremony, not as small as Jada would have preferred. About 100 friends and family. There was a pastor, and it was government sanctioned. And while the event itself was joyful and heartwarming, this would be the first of many compromises Jada would make over the years that painfully negated her own values. She had boarded the wheel train, and there was no way off. 
Not all forms of fame are created equal. Music famous is fast, current, and immediate. It's quick burning and hard to sustain. But when you touch someone's heart with music, it's forever. Once one of your songs fuses with an experience in somebody's life, there's dang near nothing that can break that bond. And when you make party music, your fame becomes synonymous with fun. You become the center of the party. That's probably why popular musicians are often associated with sex, drugs, and alcohol. If you're having sex, drugs, or alcohol, you probably want some music to go along with it. Television famous is a little different. When you're on TV, people are used to you being in their living room or their bedroom or their kitchen. They are used to watching you in their underwear. They think of you as a friend. When you're music famous, people will scream and cheer, but they're used to being kept at a distance. If Beyonce or Kanye doesn't sign your autograph, you're like, well of course not, they're Beyonce and Kanye. But when you're TV famous, people expect you to honor that friendship. TV fans are much more insulted by being denied access. But movie famous is a whole different beast. There is something about the 40-foot silver screen that exalts those projected upon it. Movie famous borders on worship, and not always in a good way. Crowds literally part when you're movie famous. Other times, they can flood and nearly drown you. There's a reverence when you're a movie star. When I was music famous, fans called me Fresh Prince. When I was TV famous, people yelled out, Hey Will! But the Monday morning after Independence Day opened to record-breaking box office receipts was the first time anyone ever referred to me as Mr. Smith. Movie stardom also had effects on my relationships. When I was music famous, my family and friends saw it as cool and fun. When I was TV famous, there was a subtle distance growing between us. But Friday nights at the Fresh Prince felt so family-oriented that we would reconnect and feel as bonded as we always had. But when I became movie famous, something fundamental changed. Some friends and family I had known my whole life shifted into one of two camps, either so respectful and deferential that it felt like we were strangers, I couldn't find my loved ones within their new behavior, or in the second camp, they became disrespectful to try and show me that I'm not no dang movie star around here. I've got another one, JL said. I was recording in New York. JL interrupted a studio session. He never does that. I really like it, he said. It has all the ingredients, great script, great director, Steven Spielberg producing, but there's one major issue. I don't want to poison your read, just read it and call me right after. The script was for another sci-fi film. It was about a secret bureau that licenses, monitors, and polices alien activity on the planet Earth. The director, Barry Sodenfeld, had asked for me by name. It wasn't an audition, it was an offer. I read the script that night. Everything about it sounded great. Comedy, creatures, space. But I had JL's same concern. Back-to-back -back alien movies I was worried that the film would be too similar to Independence Day, and then, because Independence Day had been such a gigantic hit, it felt like going back to the same alien well could only set us up to look smaller and less successful. It seemed to me that at best, this would be a lateral move. Bad Boys was a buddy cop movie, Independence Day was an alien movie, and this new script was a buddy cop alien movie. I told JL I wasn't feeling it. We thought about it over the weekend, and on Monday we passed. Steven Spielberg is on the phone for you, Will. I was in New York City recording with a studio full of hard rocks and hip hop heads. My ego could not have been more on swole than in that moment. Oh, 
Steve is not calling for any of y'all, I said. I dipped out to take the call, and in the ten yards from the studio to the phone, I got real unswole real fast. Hello, Mr. Spielberg, sir, I said in the least swole tone of voice I could muster. I had just turned down his movie. I would hate to have burned this bridge. Hey, Will, call me Steven. How are you? I'm great, Mr. Spielberg, sir. Thank you so much for asking. Better yet, where are you? New York, I said. Okay, perfect, he said. Then we can do this in person. Uh-oh. Do what? Well, you turned my movie down, and I'd like to talk to you about that, he said good-naturedly. We shared a laugh. The tone of his chuckle registered to me as, Fool, you know I made Jaws, right? Well, no, it wasn't like that, you know, I said, saying absolutely nothing. I just want to show you some images and talk about it. Barry and I are neighbors. Can you come to the Hamptons? Uh, sure. When's best? How about today? What is it with these guys in the right now, today, no paralysis through analysis? <coughs> you can chop her up. You'll be here in an hour. You'll be back in three. How's that sound? I've been to this dance before. Yes, sir, Mr. Spielberg, sir. Yes, that works for me, I said. Less than an hour later, I landed at Steven Spielberg's Hamptons estate. There he was, dressed casually in jeans and an old t-shirt, looking like he didn't realize he was Steven Spielberg. His house was a Cape Cod-style cinematic temple. Original posters of classic films, pictures of him with Hollywood greats, an office with the actual model of E.T. used in the film, concept drawings of the mechanized shark from Jaws. Everywhere I looked, I saw film greatness, but I was struck by Steven's complete absence of flexin. Here he was, Steven Spielberg, director of four of the top ten films of all time, but what stood out above all was his childlike joy for cinema. He was anxious and excited to show me the vision for Men in Black. We sat down in his office. He served homemade carbonated lemonade. I wasn't sure I'd ever had carbonated lemonade before. I was dang sure I'd never had homemade carbonated lemonade before. It was so good it caught me off guard. So why don't you want to be in my alien movie? Well, it's not that I don't want to be in it. I mean, I love the script, and I was really, really flattered that you thought of me. He could feel my hesitancy. Just tell me what the problem is. Let's see if we can fix it. I laid out all of my thoughts and concerns about Bad Boys and Independence Day and similarities and repetitiveness and my fear around getting pigeonholed into being the alien guy. He listened intently. In retrospect, I recognize his skill set as that of a master director. He spends his life listening to actors, cinematographers, writers, studio executives, producers, determining the problem, and finding a solution to synthesize everyone's brilliance into a single creation. He took a long pause, deeply pondering my reservations. Finally, he spoke. Okay, Will, I understand. Completely. Thank God. Ah, uh, okay. I'm so glad because, you know, I have so much respect for you, I said. This whole decision is making my brain hurt. We share a laugh. Then don't use your brain for this decision. Use mine. He said it jokingly, but it rang like the Liberty Bell in my mind. That time it cracked. Indiana Jones, Jurassic Park, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Jaws, The Color Purple, Schindler's List, Saving Private Ryan, oh, and E.T. It dawned on me that if one of us had to make the decision of whether or not I made this film, who should it be? We spent the rest of the afternoon together. I met the director, Barry Sonnenfeld. 
We drove around the Hamptons. We went to their kids' school. I went full fanboy on Spielberg. We talked about his process, choosing concepts, developing screenplays, his opinions about story and character and what makes a hit movie, and the differences between actors and movie stars. Barry is quite possibly the silliest man on the face of the earth. His sense of humor is as sharp and layered as anyone I've ever known. We are polar opposites, yet our comedic harmony was perfectly calibrated instantly. We cracked each other up. I loved how he saw me. They gave me a list of movies to watch and things to read and turned me on to what would become the central conceptual framework for how I chose and made movies for the rest of my career. Joseph Campbell's theory of the monomyth, the hero's journey as laid out in The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Published in 1949, The Hero with a Thousand Faces became my second literary love affair. It would not be an overstatement to say that I bet my entire movie career on this book. Joseph Campbell's work reveals a hidden story structure embedded in global mythology, folk tales, and classic storytelling. This pattern, this narrative template, has appeared across all cultures and across all time. Campbell theorizes that the reason these ideas, archetypes, patterns, and themes are so universally embedded in our stories is because they are universally embedded in the human experience. The human mind is a storytelling machine. The creation of narrative is hardwired into us. What we call memory and imagination are essentially just stories that we program into our minds as a survival mechanism to protect ourselves and to help us thrive. We are what Jonathan Gottschall called storytelling animals. Our minds abhor abstraction. From the beginning of time, humans have used character and story to make sense of the mystery of life. We need our lives to mean something. It is a kind of mental illness if we cannot shape our experiences into a story that gives our existence a sense of purpose. Campbell laid out 17 stages that encompass what he called the monomyth, or the hero's journey. Christopher Vogler, in his landmark interpretation of Joseph Campbell's work, The Writer's Journey, refined the stages to 12. Chris's book has become a Hollywood standard and a classic screenwriting textbook throughout the world. The fundamental narrative pattern of the hero's journey is as follows. A hero receives a call to adventure. Something happens in his life that forces him to embark upon a journey that takes him into a world of danger and wonder. He faces a series of challenges, tests, and trials. He encounters allies and enemies, maybe even falls in love, all culminating in a supreme ordeal. And if he proves himself wise enough and strong enough to overcome his internal wounds or traumas and external obstacles and survive this near-death ordeal, he comes away with a treasure, what Campbell calls the elixir, a rare wisdom and insight. He is now empowered to return home with the boon and do the only thing that makes a human life worth living help others find their way. Some stories just bounce off us. We don't get it. We don't feel it. It doesn't mean anything to us. But some stories penetrate. They get past our defenses and plunge into our secret spaces, bypassing our brains and inducing physical reactions. Tears, chills, laughter, gasps. They light us up creating ecstatic pleasure. They inspire us. They make us want to strive. Great stories illuminate truth and ultimately make us want to see the movie again and again and again. The list of Hollywood blockbusters that confirm to the hero's journey paradigm is almost innumerable. Just off the top of my head, The Wizard of Oz, The Matrix, Jaws, 
the Star Wars films, Titanic, Braveheart, the Harry Potter series, Rocky, The Lord of the Rings, The Lion King, Finding Nemo, Forrest Gump, The Incredibles, Silence of the Lambs, Mulan, Gladiator, Aladdin, Indiana Jones, Beauty and the Beast, and Dances with Wolves, Avatar, watch them back to back. The hero's journey became my roadmap to creating riveting characters and centering them in universally resonant stories, films that transcend language, age, race, religion, culture, nationality, education, economic status. Joseph Campbell and Christopher Vogler had codified the story elements of universal struggle, transformation, and rebirth as one's greatest self. To me, this was cinematic gold and the key to global human wish fulfillment. The movie star represents the warrior in the life or death battle against the brutality of the human condition. It is the path of the caterpillar becoming a butterfly. It is the story of Christ, Buddha, Mohammed, Moses, Arjuna. It is the story of Cassidus Clay becoming Muhammad Ali. It is the universal arc of transformation. It is the story of Santiago and the Alchemist. Men in Black checked all the boxes. It was a special effects movie with creatures, a bromance, a love story, and a perfect hero's journey. This would be a major test for the efficiency of the Will Smith cinematic success formula. Men in Black was slated for release on July 2nd, 1997. This was the same weekend that Independence Day had hit cinemas the previous year. In Hollywood, all weekends are not equal. The 4th of July was the most coveted slot of the year. It was where the studios put all of their make or break films. Because of the summer holiday, every day was like a Friday, meaning your box office numbers could be 200-300% to 300 bigger on the 4th than any other weekend. When the studios put your movie on that date, they're betting the farm on you. I decided I wanted to publicly lean into the pressure. In all of my press interviews, I began referring to the 4th of July weekend as Big Willy Weekend. They ate it up. It made headlines everywhere. In the UK, it had an added though unintended media benefit because Willie is slang for the male reproductive organ, and big means big. It was as if I was inviting my British fans to join me for Big <coughs> Weekend. The release of Men in Black took on the energy of a prize fight. It was me versus the box office. I was trying to bring to the world of film openings the same anticipation that Muhammad Ali would bring to a title fight. I wanted to come to town like Barnum and Bailey, parading into countries and cities, near and far, the ringmaster galvanizing and unleashing the global circus. I wanted to orchestrate size, scope, and spectacle, the likes of which had never before been witnessed. We were teed up and Big Willie was coming with the thunder. That wording was just for my British friends. Omar was the youngest in our crew. He'd started out as my dancer, and now that me and Jeff were performing a lot less, I had brought him in as a wardrobe consultant on Fresh Prince. Omar had a great sense of style, and he helped establish my overall fashion flavor. But he had been quietly and secretly plotting his career shot, with JL and my attention moving more and more into the direction of television and film, he wanted to be in charge of the production and management of my music career. He'd been courting the track masters, up and coming New York based music producers. They'd work with Nas, LL Cool J, Foxy Brown, and they had a vision for my return to music. Omar was anxious to break out of his little Omar status. He felt things bubbling, and he wanted his shot to contribute. 
Big bro, I'm telling you, Omar said, how the theme song for Fresh Prince popped off crazy. We gotta link a song to Men in Black. Trust me, fam, it'll be out of here. Everything in music is dark right now. You can counter-program the whole culture. When you're famous, everybody has an idea. Everybody has a new business, a demo, or a better way that you should be doing things. It's even more extreme with friends and family because they feel entitled and you feel obligated. So I listened patiently to Omar's pitch. Then he played me an idea using a sample of Patrice Russian's Forget Me Nots. The demo singer comes in on the hook, Here Come the Men in Black. I turned to Omar with that classic musician face, bopping my head and looking like something stinks. We jumped into the studio with the track masters. They modernized the drums and the orchestration. It was banging. I wrote and recorded the lyrics to MIB, and as we listened back to the rough two-track mix, I turned to Omar and said, I think you may have just gotten yourself a new job. Omar would later run the same play with Jaden and Justin Bieber on The Karate Kid with Never Say Never. Number one movie, number one record. There are very few things in entertainment that are more combustible than a hit movie combined with a hit record. Think about Whitney Houston's The Bodyguard and I Will Always Love You, Prince's Purple Rain, Rocky and Eye of the Tiger, Saturday Night Fever, Footloose, Grease, y'all get it. The alchemy of the story and the soundtrack together is like a self-perpetuating tornado sucking all the cash out of the weekend. The symbiotic relationship between movie, song, and music video was a perfect promotional storm. The song works as massive radio promotion for the movie that is essentially free. The music video acts like a trailer for the movie and the movie sends fans to buy the album and request the song and video. We were now locked and loaded. All there was left to do was to wait for the 4th of July. I mean, Big Willie weekend. <laughs>